Hey, happy Sunday. Cornerstone, would you stand to your feet as we praise the Lord together? The psalmist said, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Come on, let's praise him together. Let's put our hands together like this. Come on.
shall rise to thee. Come on, we sing holy. Holy, 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 God, your mercy full and mighty, God, in three persons, blessed Trinity, we sing holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy work shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Worship you, Jesus. Trust is in you, God. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of his spirit. Washed in his blood And what he did for me on Calvary Is more than enough Come on church, you know what? Sing it out I trust in God Let me hear you Never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Perfect to me. of how things feel, how it seems in this moment. God, we trust you. You are the author of our story. And we can sing this in faith. I sought the Lord and he heard 
and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I singing these words that we sought you that you hear us that you answered the psalmist said those words I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears and God we have a lot of reasons to feel afraid this morning the things that are taking place on the other side of the world God it could leave us full of anxiety it could leave us full of fear but we choose in this moment to say we trust in you. Our hope is not in this world. Our trust is not in this world. It is in you. You will never fail. God, I lift up the situation that's taking place right now in Israel. God, what took place yesterday in Sydney, Australia. God, we ask that the God of all peace, that the God of all comfort would be with those that are mourning, those that are grieving, that are hurting. God, we grieve with them. 
And we know that we serve a God who grieves with us in our suffering. We do that today, God. We place our trust in you, just as we've been singing today, God. That we wouldn't trust the temporary things of this earth. That our trust is only in you, Jesus, because of what you have done for us on Calvary. It is more than enough. God, every need represented in this room today and online, God, we place those things in your hands. We say, have your way in us and through us. Speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit and by your word that we would be shaped and transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ. We submit our will and our ways to you, and it's in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. Church, if you're thankful that we serve a God who will never fail, would you give him praise today? Come on. Amen. Awesome to be in church with you this Sunday morning. Before you're seated, find a couple people around you. Tell them happy Sunday. Maybe introduce yourself to someone you may not know, and then you may be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone. How are you guys doing? It's good to see you. My name is Wesley. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and it's a privilege to be with you this morning. If you're watching online, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, We're glad that you're joining us this morning. Hey, if you're new to Cornerstone, maybe this is your first time with us today, or maybe you've been coming here for a while, I want to invite you to text the word NEW to 951-425-4425. And as a way of saying thank you so much for joining us, we want to send you a Starbucks gift card. As well, uh, right after service out on the patio next to the gazebo, we're going to be having what we call Take Five. Take five minutes right after service and come and meet our pastors Um, Ask your questions about the church. See how you and your family can get plugged in. Again, right after service, five minutes, outside, on the patio, next to the gazebo. All right? Well, our next community serve day is coming up on this coming Saturday. Uh, We're teaming up with the city of Wildemar's city beautification team. That's a mouthful. I practiced that one. City beautification team. Our church is partnering with the city, and we're going to be adopting a road together and cleaning it up. Uh, As a church here in town, we want to be a blessing to the city we live in, and you and your family are invited to join us. So text the word community to the number up on the screen for more information. I believe there's also a city waiver that they need us to fill out as well. So go ahead and do that sometime this week and get involved in what God's doing in our city. Well, today also uh, marks the launch of our spring session of groups. Guys, groups is one of the best things that you can be involved with here at church. Groups have been really influential in my life, in my personal growth as a Christian, and we here at Cornerstone have a group for you. Um, Go ahead and text the word group to the number up on the screen. Click on join a group on the Church Center app. And if all else fails, Pastor Raul and the groups team will be out on the patio today after service, available to answer any questions that you might have. Um, There's life groups, discipleship groups, interest groups, as well as support groups for you to join. Well, we're going to continue this morning by receiving our tithes and offerings. And there's many ways to give here at church that will be up on the screen for you. Uh, But as one of your pastors, I want to say thank you so much for your faithfulness and, and, and your generosity as we all respond to God's gracious gifts. Um, our Philippines team is in the, in the Philippines right now. Our missions team's in the Philippines right now. And again, their work that they're doing is a direct result of your faithfulness and your giving. And so continue to pray for them. They come home later on this week. Uh, but God's doing amazing things both overseas and here in town. And I just want to say, again, thank you so much. Uh, would you join me in prayer? Lord, uh, thank you so much for being so good to us and so kind. You've blessed us, Lord, immensely. You've provided for our needs. And right now, Lord, we want to spend some time just giving back to you. Thank you so much, Lord, for the gracious gift of your son dying on the cross of Calvary for our sins, offering us forgiveness and redemption if we put our faith and our trust in you. And now, Lord, as a tangible way of our worship to you, we want to give back, Lord. Use these gifts for the furtherance of your kingdom and use our leaders, give them wisdom and and discernment to use these gifts for maximum kingdom impact here in our valley. 
Lord, we love you. God, we thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Stone, thanks for being here. We, we're right in the middle of our family portraits series, and so that reminded me, oh man, we haven't taken our family portrait yet. So last Sunday, we real quick rushed and did a family portrait. Let's put it on the screen here. That's us. There it, oh, there you go. Oh man, adorable. There was zero fighting during that family portrait. Let's look at some more realistic images of, of family. Let me show you some other some photos here. On the left here, lo it looks like a beautiful photo of uh, Grand Canyon from last year. It's missing someone, our beautiful daughter, who said it's too early to be in a photo and refused to be in the sunrise photo. This is Titus uh, last year when he had pneumonia. That was a sad time. That was actually uh, the... My wife right now is probably trying to tell me this is when he got his tubes put in a few weeks ago. But I think it was last year when he had pneumonia. It was like Easter night or something that he went to the hospital and had pneumonia. It was crazy. This third photo is just last week when my mom was leaving California to fly back to New Jersey and Titus FaceTimed her and said, don't go. And he's crying his eyes out. And this last photo may look perfectly normal. This is uh, last week as well. Shannon and I went to uh, Old Town Orange, new restaurant. We're checking it out. Uh, but the reason it wasn't posted online is because 15 seconds after we took this photo, we both offended each other, and we were silent towards each other for about the next 20 minutes until our, <laughs> our meal came. And um, yeah, but that's more real life than a once a year photo, isn't it? There's no picture perfect family. There's no picture perfect marriage because it involves sinners like us, but we serve a perfect savior who wants to help us. And we wanna to talk today about principles that we can use in our day-to-day -day marriage. And I think these principles are also um, usable to deepen friendships as well, most of them. And it's much better than just taking a picture once a year and saying, everything's fine. We don't need to work on anything. You know, a marriage is built on a solid foundation of trust. It has to be. And, and maybe we assume that we have trust or take it for you know, granted. We're like, well, I have some measure of trust. I, I married the person, right? And but we assume that just you know, romance and regular life will build trust, but that's not necessarily true. And a marriage without trust will have a lot of doubting and accusations in it and, and disappointments. And so we want to build this kind of a foundation of trust. It was, I think, two weeks ago that there was this big earthquake in Taiwan, and some of the notable pictures that came out of that were, were buildings that were leaning over but not so many that had crumbled. And it reminded me of 2010, where my wife and I took our youth group to Haiti after the massive earthquake where 200,000 people died. And we brought our youth group there to, you know, to give out food and, and support and be at an orphanage. And it was a devastating scene to watch everything crumbled. And I, and I found this article about Haiti. Why was it so different than Taiwan? It says Haiti's earthquake was more than a, just a natural disaster. It was an engineering disaster. It is estimated that more than half of the destruction could have been avoided by, by employing basic earthquake resilient construction methods. They think half of the buildings wouldn't have collapsed if they just used some basic standards. They now have a national building code, but they're having a hard time enforcing it because it's more expensive to build like that. But what struck me was the line, it wasn't just a natural disaster, it was an engineering disaster. We don't know what's gonna hit our marriage, what things are going to come our way that are gonna be difficult but we can avoid engineering a bad future incident in our marriage by building a solid foundation of trust. Jesus warns us about what can happen when we have a weak foundation. The context for Matthew chapter seven is Jesus talking about true and false disciples, not marriage, but I think it's applicable. Jesus said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, but it didn't fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. 
and the rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Jesus said, you got to make sure your foundation is on the rock. In this context, Jesus is saying, a true disciple isn't just someone who says, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but someone whose life now follows Jesus and tries to obey his commands. We won't do that perfectly, but is that the direction of the life that we're, we're aiming for? A big difference with a marriage foundation than a building foundation is that a marriage foundation isn't encased in concrete. It is always changing, always being poured, always something we can work on, and so there is always hope. But a solid foundation in marriage starts with Jesus, not our spouse, right? It's much more focused on our vertical relationship with God than our horizontal relationship with our spouse. Jesus is the foundation. He is the core of our foundation. My brother-in-law on the East Coast, he's in a union where he's just always drilling huge holes into the ground for, for pilings, right, for foundations. And so I texted him and said, tell me what you do. And he's like, what you, we, we never talk. What's going on? I'm like, I need a good sermon illustration. He says, that's really thoughtful of you. It's my birthday, by the way. No, he wasn't. Uh, he says, the smallest pile I ever put in was five inches in diameter. The, the largest was seven feet in diameter. Typically, you need at least 10 feet of solid rock to drill into for a good foundation. I, I've had to drill down as little as 30 feet and as deep as 250 feet to find that rock. I said, what makes it difficult is all the layers you have to get through. When we're done drilling, we put a piece of rebar in the hole and then grout it with something stronger than cement. The biggest pile I put in could hold 750,000 pounds by itself. Without that, if you just put it on, you know, graded dirt, you'd be in a lot of trouble if there's any kind of shaking or moving or rain or anything with that foundation. It is crucial that our marriages are built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, not all the cool things culture tells us about marriage. Now, a foundation is described by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter two. Listen to this. It's talking about us being a part of God's household. So we're a spiritual household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. The foundation is first on the apostles and prophets. So the word of God, right? God's word needs to give us direction when our opinions and ideas and advice we're getting from people is not in alignment with God's word. We have to choose God's word as part of our foundation. Now within that foundation is Jesus, the chief cornerstone right, what this church is named after, right? The cornerstone in masonry building would be a stone that was put down first so that the angles and everything else built from it would be accurate. It was the most important part of the building process. So the word of God is crucial, it's important, but the person of God, Jesus Christ, has to be the center of our marriages. And we hear that phrase, the center of our marriages, but practically, what does that mean? It means spending time with Jesus in your marriage, figuring out how that works into a date night, how that works into a fight, how that works into the mundane activities to have a relationship with Jesus. On that foundation, it says the whole building, which is the church, is, is joined together and rises. And I love how that says, it's joined together and rises. And so the foundation is the word of God, Jesus Christ, and, and the church, we need each other. We're joined together if we are going to rise and become a holy temple for the Lord. It has to be something where the church community is there. You know, we fall into sin on our own. We have all the skills needed to fall into sin on our own, but not many people rise from sin on their own, right? We need a Christian community to help us as we are being rebuilt in the Lord. Now, what do you do with cracks in, in the foundation, cracks in the marriage foundation? Well, a lot of them, some of them, I should say, can be prevented by daily maintenance or consistent maintenance. We learned this the hard way when we had um, a pool installed three years ago, and uh, I was spraying the pool, you know, when they finished putting the, you know, cement and everything in the pool, but when they, when they put the actual cement in around the pool, the contractor that was there, I was like, oh, so I got to spray it, right, for like a week? And he's like, no, you don't got to do that. It's fine. I was like, well, the owner of the company told me that I should spray it every day for a week. I don't think he's tricking me. He goes, listen, you can trust the owner who has to do all this or me. All I do is cement. I was like, 
Oh, yeah, okay, that's a good argument. I'll, I'll just trust you. And so I'm the only guy in California that didn't spray down his, his cement around his pool. And don't worry, you already knew that if you've been to our house because there are cracks all over that brand new pool cement. I'm not bitter at all about it, <laughs> right? There's some things that are avoidable with daily maintenance. When it comes to the foundation of our marriage, things like good communication, honest, straightforward, transparent communication. We should be able to take each other's words at face value with no hidden agenda, no manipulation, not having to read between the lines. It's Ephesians 4.29 that speaking of our words says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which can, can build each other up, right? That, that which is helpful. Wholesome words are helpful. Unwholesome words are, are shady and full of lies and manipulation. And so we have to make sure we are setting clear expectations with our words and, and trusting that we are honest. Um, this is one of those stories that only Shannon looks good. I don't look good at all, but don't worry. But, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think that I'm highly romantic and I'm good at surprising her. And I definitely did that early on. But there came a time about five years ago where the week before our anniversary, Shannon said, can I just, uh, can I just tell you right now that my expectations are that you would plan something in advance, make reservations in advance, not just hope that a Saturday night in Old Town Temecula happens to have a table open, because the last three years we've sat at a bar after visiting four or five restaurants and no tables were there to get our food, and it's a little less romantic than trying. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, okay. So I did that, and she has been kind enough to still be thankful for those. Now, I'm not, I'm not giving up on trying to be romantic and surprising her, but her expectations were clear, and that sure helped a lot. So I am the guy constantly disappointing my wife on our anniversary, so I am fit to give you marriage advice today <laughs> so you can trust that you're hearing good advice from me. I got this. Nailed it. Look, communication has to be clear. Commitment is also so important. We've got to keep our promises big and small. You don't build a marriage in just big moments. You don't fix a marriage with just big moments. Things are really rocky between us. We'll go to Hawaii. That, well, that'll be great. And maybe you do need some, some time away, but big moments, a, a big gift, it's not necessarily what you need because a marriage is built on 10,000 little moments of faithfulness. Oftentimes, it's a, it's a combination of those things, but in small moments that feel mundane, where we are still faithful, to honor our word, that's where trust really is built. And that kind of a commitment. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything else is from the evil one. Like you don't have to say, I, I swear things will be different this time. I swear. Become the kind of person who has integrity because when you say, yes, I'll, I'll stop on the way home and, and pick up milk. Yes, I will do this. Yes, I'll then you, you live those things out. You don't just always forget or always make an excuse why the little things weren't handled. Commitment is crucial. But also just care, sincere, self-initiated, consistent nurturing of the other person, thinking about them, right? Watching out for them, protecting them. My kids really, they get frustrated at this. They don't understand it. They don't see it as, as useful, but Shannon has accepted it. But it's never been needed, but the simple habit that I have, I'm not sure where I learned it, probably my dad taught me or something, is that uh, if we are walking on a sidewalk or the side of a street, and, I, and I'm holding Shannon's hand and the street's over there, like instinctively, I just grab her other hand and, and she's on the sidewalk or dirt and the cars are flying by me. It's probably obvious to you why I do that. If someone's getting hit, it should be me. Like, oh, well, you know, at least it wasn't me. Shannon got hit by the car. No, it's going to be me that gets taken out. And so I'll do that with my kids and tell them to, you know, and I'm always trying to tell them where a car can come from. They're going to have all kinds of anxieties when they grow up because I think cars are everywhere. And cars are in my closet. They're coming for me. Maybe, maybe you should be ready for that, right? But I, I, I'm showing protection in that simple thing. I've never needed it. I've never needed it, but it still feels like the right thing to do to show that I'm watching out for her, right? Uh, just thinking about it. Shannon just wants to know that I'm on her radar. And so even when things are busy and even when I'm at work and even when we're, we're in a fight, she wants to know that, that she's on my radar. I'll tease her sometimes and, you know, if it's a really busy day and I haven't checked in at all and it's like 3.30 in the afternoon, I'll call her and say, hey, I just, I just wanted to make sure you haven't forgotten about me. 
She goes, yeah, right, because it's, it's the opposite. That's usually, that's usually true, and, but she, she likes the joke. She does. She doesn't mind it at all. Listen, we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7, this, this word always is on repeat. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. It always perseveres. There can be care even in busyness, even while we're at work, even in all these different times. But confession is perhaps where the greatest amount of growth can happen in marriage because to confess something means that you are admitting you did something wrong, which, which is a good thing. That means there's a chance for change if we're not perfection or if we don't think we're perfect, I should say. The ability to confess is actually a gift from God himself. To be honest, none of us think like this, but we should. We get nervous about confessing our sins, and Satan tries to tell us, if you confess, it's over, right? No, you'll never be trusted again. Just bury it and hold it. Take it to the grave, right? But that's just not true. We need to bring things into the light and trust the Lord to deal with them, right? But the ability to confess is a a gift from the Lord. You you could even consider it a humble brag because confession says a lot of good things about us. It means we measure our standard by by God's standard. So when, when we see our life that is out of alignment with the Word of God, We say, you know, I need to confess, I'm not living according to what I'm reading right now. The psalmist says, the the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. It doesn't say all of your thoughts and opinions and mistakes are perfect. No, it's the word of God that that is perfect. Confessing our sins means that we are aware that one of the biggest problems in marriage is me. We, we want to think it's the, other, it's the other person. I'm not minimizing what that person may have done to you, right? But Romans 3.23 still says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. To never confess means that you think it's Jesus as perfectly sinless, and you are number two right there after that. It's just not likely, right? And confession says so much more about humility. Confession means our conscience is still working. In 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul says that for some people that are constantly rejecting their conscience or the Holy Spirit speaking to their hearts about something, their conscience can become seared as as like with a hot iron. It can become deadened. The more we say no to the Holy Spirit, the more it's like, oh, you're not listening. Okay, I'll go where I'm, I'm welcome. So it shows that we're still sensitive to the Lord's working. It means we're mature enough to consider criticism. I think it's Proverbs 12 that says, if you hate rebuke, you're stupid. It's just, they're not even covering it up. It's like, you're just dumb if you don't like feedback because that's how we change. And it means we, we know that we can face our mistakes without shame, that we know the gospel means that only Jesus is perfect and that when he died on the cross for our sins, it means that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Doesn't mean that there's no pain because of the sin that we've done towards someone else doesn't mean it's not going to be a long road of, of recovery, but confessing means that we know that God will forgive us and we don't have to live in shame. So how does this all work out practically? Well, practically, there are times where you feel like you need an apology, but this is a tricky situation. You, you, it's, it's, everyone would agree, yeah, you've been sinned against, but you haven't gotten a confession yet. You haven't gotten an apology yet. What do you do in those moments? Well, I, I'd recommend leading with confessing your own sin. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. We're talking about when I need an apology. I know. But what is it? Matthew 7, 5, that Jesus said, be careful, hypocrite. He's like, be careful. You've got a plank in your eye that you need to remove first so that you can see clearly clearly to deal with the speck in somebody else's eye. Now, this is an abused verse to kind of avoid anyone calling anybody else out uh, on sin. And that wasn't the intention. The intention is just for us to do a heart check And how much better is a conversation going to be received when we lead with, here are the things the Lord is working with me on and that you've asked me to work on. I'm working on those things, but I was really hurt by what you did and and you haven't said sorry yet. And I feel like that's causing some distance in our lives. Lead with your own fault and speak the truth in love. And you're speaking the truth, I think it's Ephesians 4.15, you're speaking the truth in love against sin, not against your spouse. Right? You're, not, you're not going to war against your spouse. You're both trying to figure out why is there brokenness? What was wrong? Right? How can we restore this relationship? The, the, the truth is spoken in such a loving, gentle way. And if you can't do it in a loving, gentle way, you, you need a moment so that you can uh, do it in that kind of an attitude. But what about when, 
when we do feel the need to confess our sins and, and apologize. Sometimes this happens after we are called out on our sin and we have just yet to apologize. Sometimes it is self-initiated, which is obviously a better situation. The main thing is don't make excuses, own it, own it. You guys ever hear like a fake apology where it's like, well, I'm sorry if you happen to feel that way. And you're like, oh wow, you couldn't have distanced yourself anymore from, from that. And you're like, no, there's no if, you did make me feel that way. Well, I'm sorry if I did. No, 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 there's no if, <laughs> you did. Stop saying the word if or I'm gonna lose my mind. I don't, Shannon and I don't talk to each other like that, but it's like, that, that's how crazy you can feel when people are tossing out the fake apology at times. It's gotta be real, you gotta own it. Great verse to memorize, Proverbs 28, 13. I'll read it because I haven't memorized it. It says this, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. We don't conceal, we confess. And we don't just confess we, confess, we also renounce. We also say, here's what I'm doing to not do that again. To, to, I can't promise I'll never do it again, but here's what I'm doing to try and prevent that from happening again. We shouldn't delay confessing our sins. Sometimes, sometimes I totally like wonder, did I offend my wife? Anytime you're wondering that, you've offended for sure, <laughs> right? But I'm like, I don't know, she seems fine. She seems okay, and you get some distance with it. You're like, I totally didn't offend her. I'm not as bad as I think. And then a week or two later, no, I, I did offend her, and now we have to deal with it. That's the wrong way. No, Ephesians 4.26 says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. I remember an early time in marriage where, you know, we tried to practice this quite literally, but then I was dumb enough to offend her at like 10.30 at night, and it took us like two hours to kind of figure it all out, and we were so exhausted, but we were taking this first little, we gotta get this done before midnight. Before midnight, the, the sun was already down, so we already didn't live literally. But it's a healthy practice to not delay confessing. And mostly be motivated by Jesus to confess your sins. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there is an if in that statement. It's the condition, are we gonna be humble enough to confess our sins? If we do, there is no if in whether or not we are going to be forgiven and cleansed, that is guaranteed. Man, if, if God is gonna heal me so I stop sinning and stop hurting my family, then I wanna confess my sins and receive that forgiveness and healing from Jesus himself. Now, when we hear an apology, we also need to be prepared for this, to respond with grace, not judgment. We have no business judging the other person. We can be hurt and request an apology, but to judge somebody else, James 4, 12 says, there's one lawgiver and one judge. It's Jesus, right? Who are we to judge our neighbor, right? And so when someone confesses a sin, we should say, oh yeah, and you know, you, you did this too. And you know, you... now I do think at times it is appropriate to let someone know maybe for the first time, hey, I forgive you, but, but this is becoming a pattern. There is a pattern here that you need to work on. There was one time in our marriage where Shannon let me know, hey, I forgive you, but this is a pattern. I was like, oh, that hurts that she's seen this not as an occasional thing. And it took like nine months of us, you know, getting past that where it wasn't a pattern anymore. And we shouldn't bring up the past when we hear an apology. God is kind enough, we're told in Psalm 103, that, that when he deals with us in accordance to our sins, he takes our sins and he casts it as far as the east is from the west. He's not gonna bring up those old hurts again that he's already forgiven us for. And so we, we, we have this brokenness in our marriage that we experience at times, and we have brokenness in our relationships and in our friendships, but it can be repaired, but it will require grace and forgiveness. Grace for the one, if it is, if it is just one, that the one that is doing the offending to receive grace from God to make a change, and forgiveness for the one who feels offended to offer and extend that forgiveness to the other person. Jesus died on the cross, not just so that we could be forgiven by God, but also so that we could do the forgiving when other people sin against us. And it's not only possible because of the cross, it's required. Let me give you one of the scariest verses in the Bible. Forgive me, I should have only read you this verse on Halloween. This is completely inappropriate to read it right now. This is terrifying. When Peter said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister? Like seven times? He thought he was pretty cool for saying that. She's like, no, like 77 times, a, a lot. And Jesus said, how about this? Listen, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. 
as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. The, the original there says 10,000 talents. A, a talent would have been 20 years worth of wages for a day laborer. So 10,000 talents would be 200,000 years worth of wages that was owed. Or, or you could say it like this, it would take 2,500 people's lifetime of 80 years of working to pay back this debt. So it's completely impossible for this debt to be repaid. Verse 25 says, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children, all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I'll, I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and, and canceled the debt and let him go. But when that service went, servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. Now, in this case, a denarius, the silver coin they're referencing, would have been one day's worth of wages, not a year's worth of wages. So this guy owed him a hundred days worth of wages, not 200,000 years worth of wages. That's the comparison. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I will pay it back. Exactly what he said to the king earlier was said to him, but he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what happened, they, they were outraged, they told the king. The king called them and said, you wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Listen to this. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in his anger, he handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all that he owed. Jesus is saying, this is relevant. Why? This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Forgiveness is non-negotiable in life. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Now, I, there's complexities when we're talking about marriage. I, I get that. Uh, but in all of those complexities, there needs to be forgiveness. The Bible does allow for when there's been too much hurt for, for divorce, but we should be working towards reconciliation and there always needs to be forgiveness. But the Bible does make room for when the pain is too great from adultery, abandonment, abuse. These aren't things that should be rushed into because forgiveness is possible. Restoration is possible. Some of the best stories I've ever heard in the local church is the long, slow road of restoration. And I gotta tell you, I can't think of a nice way to say this, but I gotta tell you, it really ticks me off. In my experience, I've only bumped into men who have done this, but I know it's both ways, right? But I'm really ticked off when a guy comes and tells me, oh, by the way, I, I, you know, I committed adultery, and, you know, but it's been two weeks, and my wife's still making me sleep on the couch or out of the house, and he's trying to rush the process of restoration. Listen, if your stupid dynamite blew up the whole dam, it doesn't get fixed in two weeks. It can take years to rebuild that. And to rush restoration sometimes shows that you don't have a sincere heart of repentance. I've only obviously had experience of men coming and talking to me about that. I'm sure it's the same in both situations, but it does, it does show in my mind a lack of real repentance. Listen, trust can be rebuilt this way with repentance, assistance, grace, and time. Let me explain that. The repentance needs to, to match the crime. John the Baptist talking to these religious leaders who were hypocrites, he's like, bear fruits worthy of repentance. What you did was horrible against your marriage covenant. You better believe your repentance should be a big deal, not just a quick conversation. Real repentance that wants to change and make that never happen again. When I say assistance, I mean the, the Christian community. We need to be honest about these struggles. And if you've lost trust by your actions, you need the assistance of someone whose trust has not been lost to walk with you so that person can be trusted by your spouse and keep you accountable towards making you know, better decisions and, and changes for a season. And you need grace. You need to beg the Lord for the strength to, to have him transform your heart so you don't go down this path again. And you need time. There needs to be time to heal. And so patience is required. But there can be a rebuilding. If you don't like the type of house that your marriage has built, you don't have to tear it down. You can renovate, right? You can say, you know, the best thing about our marriage is, is Jesus. And we're not really involving him too much, but on that foundation, we are going to rebuild trust in our marriage. Whether you, your marriage is doing fine or it's, it's decimated and, and the foundation has crumbled right now, building a better marriage has to be 
on Jesus and involving him. If Jesus really is the cornerstone, it can be rebuilt. And if Jesus is God, spoiler alert, he is, then you can have hope that he will give you the power and grace to make the changes that feel impossible in your marriage. As always, if you text the word marriage to our church number, number, you'll find great resources, books, videos, podcasts, local like crisis weekends you can get away to where they're, they're like only focuses on resetting a marriage that's about to explode. And also local vetted marriage and family counselors that you can talk to. But would you also consider doing this and giving us a call or a text or coming on in this week to let us know that, that you need help, that your marriage needs help? Would you let your pastors know? You're talking to pastors that know the difficulty of marriage, that have had their own sins and failures, and are also constantly working to keep Jesus as the foundation. You won't experience judgment, but grace and any help that we can give, and we'd be happy to do that. Father, would you please help us when it comes to making our marriages better than a once a year family portrait, Lord? Those are great, but and a day to day, If we put the effort in, Lord, with your strength, Lord, you're not gonna make our marriage perfect, but you'll make it better. We all want a better marriage. We all want better friendships and and relationships. And a lot of that's gonna involve being a trustworthy person. And so make us someone who has integrity, Lord. We know you'll do that work. We look to the one who has never let us down, who has never gone back on his word, Jesus Christ. And we ask you to help us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Andy. Appreciate that word. Lots of good stuff for us to chew on this week. Uh, Just a quick reminder for all of us, we have Take 5 out on the patio, as well as our groups team available to answer any questions you guys might have. See you next week, and God bless.